Thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, I hope everybody is staying calm and sane during election, what might be a season. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, and thank you for joining us tonight to learn some, some Torah. And I guess without further ado, we gave your, your intro the last couple of times. We're, we're at round four, um, take it away. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you guys for coming. I know some people at least feel like they have other things to do right now, but this is better, I promise. It was, I was actually like, it was very good to go to work today. And like, I didn't, you just have to do my things. Um, and I tried to give that same advice to my students. So you guys are not teenagers, so you don't need to take my, rather, my wisdom is not as much better or better than yours the way it is for them. But, um, you know, I'm glad to be here with you, I guess is what I'll say. So like I, I tried to telegraph last week, um, I wanted to look at some sort of rabbinic imaginations of biblical marriages, let's say. Um, and one I picked, maybe it will actually be like sort of a election slash leadership tangentially relevant, I don't know. Um, so the one I want to start with today was um, Rachel, Yaakov and Rachel, Yaakov and Leah, Yaakov, Leah and Rachel, this sort of weird, bizarre love triangle, as they might call it, um, that comes up in Sefer Breshit, where Yaakov ends up marrying these two sisters. I, I'm going to assume familiarity with the basic story that most of us have, right? Yaakov is sort of, he wants to marry Rachel, he falls in love with Rachel, then he gets tricked, he marries Leah, and all sorts of issues ensue. Um, I jinx ensue, right? <laughs> yes, but not, not necessarily amusing. Um, so... Right, so I guess like I wanted to, to talk a little bit about that and, and look at a few um, texts, some of which may be familiar, but hopefully I'll add some color or new angles that we haven't seen all seen before. And then um, think about what that, and I think it will also a little bit resonate with some of the stories that we've read in the past, even though, as I said, all these classes are kind of freestanding, but they can still sort of talk to each other. Um, so I'll share mine a screen if that's okay. I'm having a little bit of a tab situation today, but it's okay. Here, I'll put this here and I can close that one. Uh, and I can close that and I'll be more organized. Okay, so I call the dignity in the third wheel because you always have to have something pithy for after the colon, but I don't know if how pithy that is. Um, so, oh, and I wrote Lake of, sorry. What can I say? Okay, so I, I wanted to open with this. I thought it was, just sweet kind of. Um, so this is from Sanhedrin and it actually appears in a, in a series, in a, a sugi similar to one we saw in Yavama, which is sort of like a bunch of things to say about men and wives and marriages. And it actually comes right after a story that we had, we saw that has a parallel here of, you know, somebody says, um, you know, he quotes two verses. One is, I should be saved from a fate worse than death, which is a woman like your mother, he says to his son. And the other one is like, you know, women are sort of like, you know, a woman really like basically like you know brings you peace of mind and whatever and he says to his son like your mother and she says how right because she's she sort of has that a tumultuous relationship it seems but um right so that in, in a context of a sugya like that it says here right except with maybe a little more positive spin right ain ish mate elali ishto a husband only dies for his wife which seems to me as safari translates it it's primarily she who suffers the pain Okay, the ain't, but it's not just because being a widow was pretty bad in the ancient world. The ain't isha made to El Allah, right? And the husband is the one who suffers the most from his wife's death, which I, I don't know if this is true categorically, but it, I think it's certainly true. We can all think of couples where this was true, right? Where they had sort of been inseparable for 50 years and then, you know, and one of them had sat by the other in the hospital or in the nursing home for 15 years and then they just sort of like didn't know what to do afterwards. Um, so, right, and the proof texts are sort of interesting, and this is the segue, right? So, Shanamar, the first proof text is about Elimelech Ish Nomi, right? Elimelech, the husband of Nomi, dies in, in Sefer Root, right? Um, that, you know, like he's Ish Nomi, even though his death has impacts for his whole family in the end of the story, um, but he's you know, Nomi is the one who sort of feels it the most. And this proof text for a, a woman, a husband being the one who feels it the most for his wife is. Um, Yaakov says about Rachel, right? Rachel died on me. And even that way of saying sort of like Yaakov personalizes it for himself, even though, right, like who's he talking to when he says that, if anyone knows? So I believe, 
Well, somebody can check me on this. I believe he's talking to Yosef, Rachel's son, right? So it's not just like, well, she was my wife and you're Yehuda and you didn't care about her as much because she's just your stepmother or sister or mother or whatever. But like, it's actually her son and it's saying, it's sort of like the loss is personal to Yaakov in a way that it's not to others, right? That like Yaakov and Rachel have this kind of bond that maybe, well, maybe first of all, Yaakov and Leah don't, but that also is going to, just sort of having that as a background, I think, makes what we're going to then read more remarkable in some ways. Um, okay. Okay. So this is, I'm going to pick up in this Sukkot and Megillah. There's a long section in sort of the, the teens, the teens pages of Masachat Megillah that's basically, unlike most other parts of the Talmud, just like goes through Pasuk by Pasuk of Megillah to stare and says stuff about them. Right, so it'll say like, what do we think about that? Who was a Hashverosh? What did he do? Whatever. What does it mean? What says by he? Like all this stuff, and then it just goes on to the next pasuk. It's like six or seven pages. This is in there, um, and it's talking initially about the pasuk. Esther didn't tell people who she was, right? And it had things to say about that. I kind of cut those out because the, the important thing is just that that's the issue, right? The issue is that Esther is keeping her ethnicity a secret when she's in Ahasuerus's palace. And here we have this statement of Rabbi Elazar. Rabbi Lazar, Amar Rabbi Lazar, my dichtiv lo yigrami tzadik anav. Right? What is the meaning of that which is written? He withdraws not his eyes from the righteous. I have this actually open here. Um, I think. I use the wonders of Safari. Here it is, right? This is an EO. So keep from EO as a rule. It's better to look them up because I can't even usually figure out how to pronounce them. So lo yigrami tzadik anav, right? He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, being God, right? That Melachim say, right? With kings on the throne, he seats them forever. They are exalted. So we're going to have a little bit of a pun, I think, a reading of this. Lo yigrami tzadik enav, right? Means God doesn't take his eyes away from the righteous and something about kings forever, okay? So those are going to be the two pieces. God's eyes on the righteous, kings forever. Um, this teaches, right? Bishart sniyut shehayta ba b'rachel, zachta v'yatza mimenu sha'ul. Bishart sniyut shehaya ba b'sha'ul, zachta v'yatza mimenu ester. So because of the sniyut, right, that we'll think about what that word is meaning here. Because of the sniyut that Esther had, right, she was, she merited to have Sha'ul, Saul, as a descendant. And because of his same attribute of sniyut, he merited to have Esther as a descendant, because as we know, Esther is Mordechai's um, cousin, really, not niece. And I know Susan is knowing the Megillah very well right now for us. But right, so she's Mordechai's cousin, and Mordechai is described as he's, he's descended from um, Kish, who's Shetwell's ancestor. Um, so like, oh, okay, meaning how how literally to take that as a, a statement of like literal paternity, I don't know. But meaning there's, there's clearly a connection. So, right, Sha we have Rachel, Sha'ul, and Esther. Um, so first of all, how does the Pasuk teach us that? So the thing about he establishes forever with kings seems to be the second half, right? Because of the right, the merit, they get these two, these, like the King Sha'ul and also Queen Esther. Okay, and over a long period of time, right? Um, what, where does Sneut come from? Something about withdrawing your eyes? Maybe. I think it's probably a, a pun and it's reading it as anav. anav. He won't take it away from a, a modest, righteous person. I could, I'm open to being convinced otherwise, but I think that's what it is. Um, right? So basically, right, a modest person will get rewarded in the end, right? Because as we're going to see, well, what Esther's modesty is what we just saw, or Esther's sniut is her willingness to withhold her information about her ethnicity for a purpose, right? Um, but it's it's gonna it's gonna have a lot to do with withholding, at least for some of these people. Okay. Umay, but the, the Gemara is gonna try and explain what does it mean? Umay sniut haitaba berachel. What was the sniut shown by Rachel? Right? Dichtiv, here's the Pasuk. Um, but now we're gonna sort of go back. It's going to be a long story to prove what the 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 is, though many of us know it, but we may not know all the details. Okay, so they gave Yaakov to Rachel. Yaakov told Rachel that he was her the brother of her father, which the simple meaning is he's her kinsman, right? And he is um the, the actually the the pasuk goes on with right, who is her father's brother and her mother's and Rebecca's son, 
right? But her father's brother means like I'm your kinsman, right? But they're going to be more literal about it, as is the want of Midrash sometimes, right? So he said, I'm your father's brother, right? Who is he really her father's brother? Hello, Ben He's really her father's nephew. Why does he say I'm your father's brother when he's really your father's nephew? So we're going to have to explain what he really meant. Really what he meant is this line was sort of a cryptic part of a longer back and forth the Yaakov and Rachel had, which goes like this. Ella Marla, so he, rather what he said to her is, will you marry me? Right? This is their first meeting, remember. He says, will you marry me? Amr Le'in. And she said, yes. Mehu, but Abba Ramahu, my father, is a trickster. And you won't be able to overcome him. Meaning, like, I would love to marry you, but good luck with that, Charlie. You know, my father will find some way to weasel out of it. Um, so he said to her, I am as tricky as your father. I can be his brother, meaning his match, right? I can sort of match head to head with your father in trickery. Like, you know, let me try it, right? Amarle, umi shari the tzaddiki, the squee beramuta. She said, is it, what do you mean? Like, are tzaddikim even allowed to trick people? Which this is sort of getting to one of the central issues with Yaakov as a character is like, we call him Ishtam, the innocent, and like, it, it seems like an ironic name for much of his life, right? He tricks his brother, he tricks Lavan, he seems kind of sketchy, he runs away from things. Like, so, um, right, so it's interesting that that's sort of front and center in this and many other Gemaras, right? Where like, Yaakov is almost bragging about his trickery capabilities. And she asked, Rachel is sort of the voice of truth here who says like, are you allowed to do that? Right? Aren't you supposed to be such a big righteous person? Right? Um, and he said, Amr la'im, he said, yes, im navar titavar, vimakesh tipala, right? With the pure, you deal purely. And with the perverse, you show yourself subtle. So this is, okay, we'll talk, that's how they, um, they translate it, I'll take it. Biblical translation is done by somebody else who is an expert in Bible, it's always good, right? Basically, for pure people, like said, you can deal purely, but there's nothing that says, right, when they go low, we can go low. When they go high, we go high, because we're good people. But when they go low, we can go low. There's permission in this pasuk, basically, to sort of deal in kind with a bad guy, um, according to Yaakov, the way he reads it. So interestingly, where does this pasuk come from? This is going to come up, or I don't know. So here we are. I can close now, Eve. Um, here we are in 2 Samuel 22, also known as Shmuel Bet. Um, here it is. With the pure, you act in purity. With the perverse, you are wily. It's talking about God, but he's, but Yaakov is sort of saying he can do it too. Um, we go back to the very beginning. So we're in Shmuel, right? And this, if you read this, this is all sort of, it's it's like one of these chapters of Tehillim that appears in Shmuel, or not Tehillim, but of poems written by David. Right? David addressed the words of this song to God on the day that God saved him from all of his enemies and from Shaul, right? Which is kind of interesting, because remember our second, we have um, Rachel, Shaul, and Esther are the people who de demonstrate Sniut. And here we have David is kind of on the Yaakov side, but Yaakov and Rachel are talking, as we're gonna see, they're gonna end up sort of on opposite sides of this issue. Rachel is the Tzniyut person, right? And her descendant is Shaul. And on the other side, we have David, who's sort of the anti-Shaul, and Yaakov. David and Yaakov, who kind of are the anti like for a mo from a moment where David is opposing Shaul. Okay. Or has vanquished Shaul or whatever. So, so she seems to accept that like, okay, if you're allowed to, you're allowed to, I guess we'll see. So he says, I'm allowed, my Rami Yuta. She said, she, she said, so like, what's your father going to do? Meaning like, what's his motive here? I'm rolling. She said, I have an older sister. Come on, he's not going to marry me off before her, sort of the classic story, right? And she actually says this in the in the biblical text. Is, or sorry, Lavan says this later. Right? We don't do it that way. We always marry off the oldest first, right? So Masar lasti my name. So he gave her signs. Um, what these signs are? So some of, some of the translations translate them as like tokens, like a literal thing that she could give him. But I think most understandings are that it's like a, you know, a secret code, a password, right? At the wedding. I'll ask you, I'll say like, does the eagle fly at midnight? And you'll say something else, right? And that will, I'll know it's you. You'll say something that like only you would understand, right? Only I would understand. So they have some sort of secret code so that he'll know that it's really her, which is interesting, similar, like just as a parenthetical based on what we were learning last week about husbands not understanding their wives here, it seems like, right, that there's an assumption that is totally plausible that you would not recognize the woman you've fallen in love with. And we're gonna try and overcome that. 
right? Like because of their actual like existence of special communication, they think that they can overcome that sort of like physical barrier of maybe not recognizing each other, maybe because they're all wrapped up or whatever it is. They didn't um, have lights. They didn't have indoor lights. It's true. And maybe, I mean, like whatever, sisters can have similar voices and although we'll see, maybe there's other, okay? So, okay. Kimata Lilia. So when the night came, the wedding night came, Amra, which is a long time later, right? It's seven years later. Okay. Amra, hashta. She sort of, like, Rachel has been like, she's been in on this plan for seven years. And then, like, the night comes and she's like, actually, like, what's going to happen to Leia? I haven't thought this through, right? Um, you know, my, my sister is going to be shamed. So she gave them to her. Nihala is like a, a pronoun for when you have, a, like, a second, second person, like, to her, right? She gave them to her, so you have, like, another person. I don't know. I didn't explain that well, but anyways. So she gave them to her. right? This explains the pasuk in the morning. She was Leia. Right? Like how could she was Leia the whole time? What does it mean? All of a sudden she's Leia. Like how could he be so shocked? Right? Because of the simanim, he didn't know until now. Right? Because of that, that's why she had this descendant of Shaul. So a few things. First of all, some of us may be familiar with a version of this story in which Rachel hides under the bed and basically like talks back to Yaakov all night, right? Um, which is kind of like, you know, and it becomes sort of like her her massive self-sacrifice in this moment becomes a, you know, she, she uses it to plead for God. I actually didn't bring that story here, but um, so I think that's one version. But I think this version is also, and like, that's sort of an extreme of whatever this form of snee is which we'll talk about in a second. But even in this one, I think what's kind of interesting is that like, you can, it's sort of like, um, maybe it wasn't Rachel's voice, but maybe Leah and Rachel are close enough that with the secret code, which Yaakov has trusted Rachel with, he can't imagine that anyone else would have it. And we're able to do, all, to assimilate all sorts of weird anomalies into what we expect to be true. Um, uh, so I was, I've been thinking for a, a lot for, I don't know why, about the movie Gattaca. I don't know if anyone has ever seen it. So there's a scene in Gattaca without, with no spoilers, where basically there's, there's two people who are impersonating, one of them, the two of them have one persona, and each of the, each of them has different parts that are required to make that persona without getting too detailed. And basically, like, there's a scene where one person, the one who's been the public face, who's been interacting with people is absent. And the other one who basically provides like the genetic material because they live in the dystopian future shows up and has a conversation with somebody else, like posing as the other guy. And they don't look the same. Like they're not the same person, but because everybody in society is sort of, there's so many other facts about the situation that make it impossible for there to be two different people. People kind of like are okay with that. And it feels to me like that's kind of what's happening here too, which is that like, I don't know if that analogy helped anyone who has not seen that movie, but basically that like sometimes when the circ there's so many things about the circumstances that seem that they could only mean one thing that we're able to overlook other things, right? We're able to overlook the fact that like, actually this is not Rachel, right? Because Yaakov can't imagine, in some ways Yaakov himself gets tricked, right? He can't imagine that Rachel would have betrayed him. So like, yeah, her voice sounds a little different or like she didn't get that joke, that's weird, but like, obviously it's her, right? Um, and it's not her. So like in the morning, he has this realization of like, oh, it's not her because now it's light out. Um, okay. So because of this behavior, Rachel has Shaul. So what, what, how would we define what is sort of sneut in this story? Willingness to go along with trickery. Okay. Well, who's being tricked? Yaakov. Right. So Yaakov is being tricked, but I'm not sure that he's being tricked out of his trying to trick love one, right? There's like a lot of tricking. It's like a multi-cross trickery, right? Like, but, right. But, 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 but Miriam, the, the person who's doing the tricking in this particular incident is Rachel. Sure. Yes. I mean, it, I mean, it, it could be layers also. She's definitely a, 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 she involved in the trickery, but th it seems to me that Sinea here is that she keeps silent knowledge that she has uh, for, for other purposes. Okay, so she keeps certain knowledge silent, but she, she also shares knowledge with her sister, right? She shares it with her sister, but not her husband or her wannabe husband. Um, right, so I think it's sort of like a, it's an interesting definition, but also her trickery here seems to be, it's opposed to both Yaakov and Levant, right? 
Yaakov and Lavan are sort of not sneas, right? They're not engaging in any kind of sneud. It seems to me, I don't know if you agree with that. Rachel is being compassionate towards Leah. Okay. So that's, that paints her as a kinder, a more positive character. Right, so I, I think, but, and sorry. also, but also, the, in to, to riff on what the person before me just said, exposing Leia in a bedroom situation would be highly untoward. So she's preserving the snoot of her sister to some great extent. Right. So she's she's preserving some kind of privacy or lack of shame for her sister. And she says, my sister's going to be shamed. In order to prevent shame for her sister, she does a few things, right? First of all, she engages in some in a form of deception, right? But that deception involves is not for her to get her own way, right? It's for her sister to not be shamed. Unlike Yaakov and Lavan's deception, which was for them to get their own ways. I think that's sort of where it's where it's that it's that feature of it that maybe is why it's called Snoot in some way, right? That she's sort of, she's taking, she's taken her, she's, she's an actor in the situation, but she's acting in order to actually remove herself from the situation. Um, well, let's think about that for a second when we go to Shaul, right? How it impacts on this idea, right? What about Shaul? We said Shaul also is a descendant of um, Rachel and he also had Snoot, right? Dichtiv, that Devar Mucha lo right? Shaul sort of reluctantly gets, he, there's this whole saga, he loses his donkeys, he goes looking for them, he meets Shmuel, Shmuel gives him all this sort of information, um, and Shmuel takes him up on the roof and says, you're going to be the king of Israel, basically, and he comes home, and he talks to his dad, and he tells him, like, some of the stuff that happens to him, but he doesn't tell him that, like, oh, and by the way, I'm going to be the king of Israel, right, um, so this, right, Asher Amar Shmuel, right, Right, he didn't tell him what Shmuel said. Esther. Right, so because of that, Esther came out of him. And here, what is Sneud? For Shaul, that's it. That's what, that's the Amar Rabbi Elazar is another thing. Um, I mean, we'll read it, but it's a new thing, right? So what Shaul did, he didn't tell his father that, that he was going to be the king. Sort of um, a, like, not, like, speaking, like, not, like, uh, just just talking and being, you know, being uh, arrogant to a sense, like, oh, this guy told me I was going to be king. You know, I met this guy. He was just kind of really being very humble. I guess it's sort of like that, a humble sort of thing. Right. So here it seems like it could be just sort of a, a familiar, like, sorry, humility, like a nav in the Pasuk, if that's what it is. I'll try with the chat. Yeah, he's not bragging about his dreams, right? Oh, my mother is here, right? Self, there's something about self abnegation that was from last time, right? I think that it, there's something about withholding, right? For for Shaul, it's pretty clear, right? That like what's called snood here is with, withholding something where you could promote yourself and you're not, right? Um, and if we if we put that back into, um, right, Shaul, this is a feature of Shaul in general, right? That he's nechbal hakelim and other times he's sort of a reluctant leader. Um, and it doesn't actually, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, right? It doesn't work so well for him actually to be so reluctant. But okay, um, so right, if we if we bring that back, right, it's true, Rachel's form of withholding is actually very different, right? Like Viva said, it's not that like she just doesn't say anything, right? She says a thing that she wasn't supposed to say in order to deceive her husband, right? It's, it's quite different, but I think that the, the frame is that like her motive there is not self-promotion, but in fact sort of negating herself for her own desires for the sake of someone else. Um, now, why is Shaul doing it for the sake of what is totally not clear. Right. Um, it, it, it seems that Rachel is very um, purposeful or strategic. That's what I was, I mean, Shaul, it seems to me like a classic definition of modesty. You don't start telling everybody like Macbeth, you start you know, promoting yourself as soon as you hear some whisper in your ear about some, uh, that you're uh, some grand thing. So he seems to be standard non-strategic, although again, maybe there's a strategic aspect here too. Maybe, um, but I think, no, I think you're right that I, I agree with that, that like she, meaning, yeah, that like, right, Shaul's is a much more expected definition of Snee, right? You don't have to tell everybody everything special about yourself. You don't have to be like, oh, look at me, I'm so awesome, right? Like, you keep some things to yourself because there's no need to say them, right? Whereas, like, Rachel, it's not quite like that, but then I think, like, it kind of asks us, and to look at, like, and if we actually, if we think back to the very beginning, what Esther is doing is also the same. She's not saying something, right? She's 
but there it is strategic also, right? She's not saying her ethnicity, but she's able to sort of like keep it under wraps, even though like this, the part that came before in the Gemara is about how it would be sort of like, um, it created awkward social situations for her, let's say. But she's able to sort of like desist anyway. But Rachel, it's not, what she's desisting from is marrying Yaakov, right? So I think that like, big adult, that's what, it, that's the frame, right? She's withholding her own sort of desire to marry, but it's true that she does it through active orchestration, not through just not saying something. Um, and that like that form of orchestration, which is sort of looked down on for Yaakov and Laban seems to be looked positively on when it's her, right? I mean, if you wanted to push it, you could even say, right, like when Yaakov says to her, you're allowed to trick people who are doing something wrong. She's like, actually, the more I think about it, you're doing something wrong, Yaakov, so I can trick you. I don't know, that's like a little, a little much, but maybe, maybe that is a part of what's happening here. I don't know. Um, okay, so I just want to, I want to finish this, but I'm a Rabbi Elazar, right? Rabbi Elazar said, right? When God sort of hands out greatness to people, right? He sort of gives it out to his descendants, as we have a pasuk that says he'll sort of make them seated up high forever. But if somebody becomes haughty about it, then God will pull them down. Um, which is sort of like a, it's a comment on an irony that I think is going to run through these sources, which is, right, I'll put it this way, certainly for Shaul, his modesty here is praised, but it's not clear that he actually has the personality that is good for being a king right? It's not actually because of his modesty that he fails, although it kind of is, right? Um, when he, so in the story where Shaul's kingship is finally taken away from him, he has, first of all, he hasn't waited for Shmuel, that happens before, and then he, ha he has this war with Amalek, and he decides to spare the king and some of the animals, and when Shmuel confronts him, he says, and remember, he says, I did what the people wanted me to do. They made me do it, which is in some ways the same trait, right, of like, oh, I'm not such a big deal, I'm just the king, whatever, right, and then like, that's actually really bad, because when you're the king, you can't be like that, you have to take responsibility, even if the people didn't make you do it, right, even if the people did make you do it, sorry, you would still have to take responsibility, all the more so when it was actually him who did it, right, so, right, there's something about this trait that doesn't work so well, and also with Rachel, right, like, it's true, she saves her sister from shame, and then she just gets the two of them locked into this, like, epic battle over a husband, where both of them are unhappy, right, or potentially unhappy. So like, it, it's a character trait that's being praised, but then doesn't always lead to sort of like a positive, you win in the end kind of situation, which is why I have putting this, this sort of claim, maybe bright or whatever at the end is, I think trying to soften it a little bit, but we have to wonder like, does that actually play out in real life? Miriam, can I, I can't yeah. help thinking about this concept about Snea Lechet and how on earth that can be reconciled with any of this or whether we just, I'd have to leave it aside. It just seems such a, it's such a, yeah, uh, sorry? It, no, say more, meaning like. Yeah, I mean, how do you be Hatznei Alechet with God? I mean, this, all the business that we're talking about here is very, it's about what's in your head or your body, or wherever you put thoughts in, in that concept. It's not something that's observable by anybody except you, but how can you be Hatznei Alechet with God? It's like, it seems very, contradictory to everything we're talking about here about preserving something aside or or or, or, or deception or any I mean and, and the answer could be there's nothing to do with Hatznei Alechet there and these concepts here but it still seems too big for to 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 not need some kind of reconciliation I mean I don't know to me I would say that like actually meaning Rachel's situation is a little different because it becomes it becomes evident to other people eventually. But in the moment that she makes that decision, right, she's making a decision to harm herself, and the only one who sort of sees it is God. In some way, right? she's making it because of a sort of godly motive in some way of saving someone else. So that's sort of how I would see it. Is like, or even depending on Shaul's motive or Esther's motive, right? Like they're they're making this Neus like choice because of a motive, a sort of like a, a motivator that comes from, that doesn't come from social pressure, for example. It's the opposite of social pressure that comes from either like their, I don't know if their faith is maybe like reading too much into it, but somehow their sort of, their soul, I guess, 
don't know if I don't know what you think about that. So I, I suppose you think it, I, I think I didn't ever thought of it that way. For me, it felt like it's a, it's a particular interpersonal relationship between you and God, in which you walk with modesty with God. It's not about your relationships to society or anything like that. It's the idea of withholding or I don't know what you, however that we we're thinking about that sneered here, withholding something from God, uh, you know, in this kind of way of not showing, you know, not showing everything or I don't know what. So maybe you, what you interpret is, is about your relationship with society to do it in such a way that it's, it, it, it shows sneered with God. But I felt like that you know, it's about your relationship specifically with God. And I don't understand how that's possible in this context. Um, I mean, what I would say there is right, like that means make space for God, meaning like you uh -huh. have to you have to not fill all the space in your world or in your life in order to make space for God. Um, and that's sort of that's how it could fit with like the idea of snooze withholding. Um, I don't know that that pasuk is specifically in the background here, but I think it's a good question, right? Like that, because that's sort of one of the, right? How does snoot become like a word for a good thing? Partly from that pasuk, so I think it's very fair. I mean, it is it is quoted so frequently. I mean, it may not be quoted here, but it's such a emblematic use of the word snoot that it's uh, anyway. It felt like that we couldn't leave yeah. it out. If, if no, I think that. that's very fair. Um, yeah, I think it's like that. That's what I would say. That there's there's some degree of like meaning. If we think about Hatsnei Alecha just as a, as a phrase, why would you, what does it mean to walk homely? Like meaning, I think that part of that is in order to make space, you know, basically there's no space for God among the people, like sort of like in the story, right? Among the people who themselves sort of take up so much space, right? There's not space for God. Um, similar to the idea maybe of like the Yates or Hara sometimes referred to as like the yeast in the dough, right? Because it makes you puffy. You kind of take up too much space. Um, for your Yates or Tov. Anyways. Let's pay off for Torah. Um, okay, so I've, I'll see about the shla. I like it, but it's not actually on point. I just thought it was very cute. I'll maybe I'll do it. I'll do it. Are you guys okay? <laughs> okay. Um, so the shla. I actually forgot to look up his biography before. I feel like I want to say he's like a 16th century Kabbalist. Um, that's like an easy guess, but. Somebody else can look it up and tell us, right? So he wrote this book called Shnei L'chot Abrit, and it's organized in various ways. And he's a lot of interesting ideas that sort of are found originally there, I think. Um, so he he's talking about this and he says, right, th this is in this is similar to a lot of conversations about, the, there's a lot of sort of rabbinic imagination about the Torah is God's gift to us. And what if the non-Jews want the Torah and how can we prove it's really ours? Um, some of it obviously sort of inspired by Christianity as his writing is, but not on exclusively, I think. Um, there's this whole sugi at the beginning of the Zara about like the non-Jews say like, why didn't you give us the Torah, give it to us now. And like God sort of eventually is like, no, Israel is my only special people, even though he gives them a chance. Um, so here it's HaKadosh Baruch Hutzivat Torah Shabel Peh, right? You shouldn't write down the oral Torah. This is my translation, so I apologize for any issues, right? The reason is the tam. They're sort of um, they're simanim. These kind of signs are in the the oral Torah is a form of these signs that um, God gave to Israel. Just like I didn't I didn't know how to translate lahav, but like you know, not like, but like, right? I don't want to say that God is like Yaakov, the husband who wants to get with Rachel, but like it was kind of like that. God gave. Simanim to B'nai Israel, just like Yaakov gave Simanim, because God knew that the nations are going to translate the Torah, but later on, right, Israel are going to be the only one who can prove that it's really theirs because they have the Torah Shabbat al Peh, the secret code. Um, so I just thought that was sort of like an interesting reading of this, um, this story, and also like misses the part where Rachel subverts it, and actually you can't tell who's who with the secret code, but... I don't know, be that as it may. Um, so I, I sort of like that, so I wanted to add it. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. All righty, thank you for Googling for me. Um, okay, so here is a, a similar reading of a, maybe a similar text from Kala Rabati. Um, another thing, Kala Rabati is what we call Masechto Kitanot, which are like these, um, collections of Tanaitic or quasi Tanaitic material that are not part of the Mishnah and are things. And they come actually from different times. 
I'm not exactly sure how, but this 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 seems to be a commentary actually on a chapter from Derech Eretz, which is another Masachet Shana, um, and it starts with something about how a Tamid Chacham should sort of be um, like self-effacing essentially, and you should be like you shouldn't you shouldn't be like a tyrant in your own home and your whole family. You should sort of put yourself down before your family. Um, which is kind of interesting based on some of the stuff we have seen or will see about like the relationship of husbands and wives and kind of like lording it over people. Um, so it starts with that and then it has a bunch of other suggestions. And here's one, which is right? You should put subordinate is a good translation, your will to the will of your fellow, right? Because that's what Rachel did for Leah and David did for Shaul. Okay, so I just thought this was really interesting because previously our two people who had this, it's going to be the same story about Rachel and Leah, right? But previously it was Rachel and Shaul are the same, and now it's Rachel and David are the same, right? If we go back to the to sort of the David thread from above, David, right, remember, was on the Yaakov side. Yaakov is quoting David in his vanquishing of Shaul, and Rachel ends up sort of doing the, well, she tricks Yaakov in order to untrick Lavan and her sister, right? Um, so she's sort of like using Yaakov's reasoning, but not actually. She's sort of on the other side from them, right? Like David, sort of the, the actual victor, the person who actually becomes the king is not Shaul, right? Um, okay. So here, Shaul is going to be, sorry, David is going to be on Rachel's side. So that's already, I think, kind of an interesting thing. Okay. So here's the Pasuk, it goes through the same thing, right? Why does he say he's her brother? Really, he's not her brother. He's her cousin so it must be that right her his father brother and his father's nephew so it's really that he's saying i can ma- i can match your father in um trickery and she's you know el Amra, he said you know marry me so here it's a little different she doesn't say yes first she says oh well, i have this older sister um you know, and I don't want my father to trick you, so why don't you just marry my sister first and he said oh i'll trick your father which is kind of interesting because here she suggests right, this love triangle situation, where like, um, you know, we'll marry my sister first, why don't we do it on the up and up, right, just marry my sister, then you can marry me, um, and he doesn't want, which is like, you know, there's biblical legal problems with that, but okay, um, so he, and she doesn't ask him, how are you allowed to trick people, right, so he says, no, I don't want to do it that way, I want to marry only you, right, um, I can sort of out, out trickify him, um, he quotes a different pasuk, which has basically the same thing of sort of like, if good, be good to them, but if bad, be bad to them. Masai um, Siman, right? So he gave her a sign. When he, meaning Lavan, brought Leah, he said she's going to be embarrassed. Maybe it's that like she sort of hadn't realized what it would mean to actually use the siman, right? She thought of it, I don't know if this is true, but she kind of thought of it as like, oh, well, this is like the anti-Rama'ut card, great. And then when she sees what it's actually gonna mean, right? It's not like, oh, he can't marry my sister because it won't be me, but like the way we're gonna find out that it's my sister, she's gonna be embarrassed in front of everybody, right? Um, so she said, my sister's gonna be shamed. So she could see my name, right? And therefore, by Hebrew book of Renalia, how could it be that she wasn't laid out the whole time? This is when he found out. Okay, so it's basically the same midrash. I mean, I'm sure we could we could spend time a little bit on the differences, right? Um, but the the way it's described is not sneut, it's haveritz on cham if neiritz on chavercha. Right? How do they what's the I can't think of English for a second. Um, right. Subordinate your will to the will of somebody else. Right. So, right, oops. Right, it's sort of, it, it's focusing on this idea of Rachel sort of putting her sister before herself, even though she has like a very legitimate desire here um, and plan and whatever else. And again, right, I think like we can ask, well, where was, where was that plan? Where was that desire to put her sister before herself when she made the plan? I don't know, but um, okay. The David, Le Shaul, what about David and Shaul? Gemiri, kol halim shach bepach, malchuto poseket, right? We have learned, or maybe he had learned, right? Um, whoever is anointed with oil becomes the true king, right? Um, meaning like your, your um, 
with oil from a flask, I guess, is going to be the true king, right? So David sort of, once David is anointed, which is very soon after he meets Shul and a long time before he actually becomes king, right? He knows that he's going to be the king. Um, sorry. This rule is probably actually derived from the psukim, but okay, sorry. Let me take a step back, right? Depending on what the receptacle is, if it's a little vial or like a jug that, that holds the anointing oil, then your kingdom is not going to last forever. But the way they explain it is because the jug is fragile, but a, like a, um, I don't know if that's true, right? A horn, which is more durable, is going to symbolize a longer kingship. So David somehow basically, whether or not David actually knew this in the imagination of this Midrash, David knows that because of the way he's been anointed versus the way Shaul has been anointed, he ha is more like his um, his kingship is going to last for longer, right? He's going to be the real king, you know, he's going to last, um, right? V'hu yada desofe lemimlach, and he knew that he would eventually become king Below Amar Lemedchia, but he wouldn't tell Shaul, right? He didn't tell Shaul. This says, right, he didn't want to push him away, meaning he didn't sort of lord it over Shaul. Now, like, I don't know, what do we think about that interpretation of David's actions? I mean, if, if I were to ask you 20 minutes ago, so David finds out that he's supposed to replace Shaul as king pretty early on in his relationship with Shaul, and he keeps the information to himself. What would you say about why he does that? Okay, self preservation. Yeah, he doesn't want Shaul to kill him. Okay, that's number one, right? Number two, right? It seems like maybe part of David's initial plan is like, oh, I'm going to marry Michal and then I'm just going to become the king the regular way, right? I'm going to succeed Shaul by being the son in law. Um, and you know, Yonatan is okay with that. Um, and like, right? So, like, it's better not to alienate him. It's like self preservation to not say this. So, it's, I think it's very interesting that this text instead says, no, what it is is that right? Like, he doesn't want to upset Shaul, right? He he could have just said, like, I'm going to be the king, move out of the way, but he doesn't want to, right? Because he wants to preserve, preserve Shaul's dignity in some way, which is, by the end of the story, as many of us may know, right? Like, Shaul's dignity is basically gone. Um, at some point, you should, I, I highly recommend learning Safer Shmuel with Rabbi Silver, who has very much influenced my understanding of it. Um, but like, right, so this is sort of a weird, similar to the Shaul one almost, like it's sort of weird because in our ways of thinking about kingship, right, all of these things have, um, right, all of these sort of, there could be very plausible political motives for these so-called self-withholding behaviors or sort of like, you know, putting someone else first behaviors. Like there could be a very political motive. It's true, right? David later does also hold back from killing Shaul. Maybe this is sort of a projecting that backwards. But again, right, I mean, this is a Rabbi Silver position, which I think is very true, right? Almost everything that David does can be read as both high-minded and very shrewd. And, right, like, um, right, you could read that as, like, he truly feels, and when he talks to Shaul, it sounds like he truly feels like Shaul is basically my surrogate father. How could I possibly do this to you? But also, he announces a rule, how could I ever kill Mashiach Hashem? Right, you can never kill the person who's been anointed by God. Guess who's the next person who's been anointed by God? He's right here. Can't kill me either. Right, like he's sort of establishing a self-serving precedent as well as so um, you know sort of saving Shaul in this sort of moment of emotional tenderness. So I think right, this text is clearly choosing one side of W to emphasize, which is the pious side, right? Um, but it's sort of interesting that we have that as the second thing, right? When you it seems like, right, the fill-in for Tznut is sub subordinating your will to somebody else's, and David is somehow doing that also. Um, so I don't know if anyone has, feels like, are you okay with me just sort of overlapping those two things and saying they're the same? Yeah? I don't know. I mean, I think it's certainly, I'm, I'm, I've convinced myself, so, you know, it must be okay. Um, but, yeah. So, so basically we've had Rachel and Shaul, Rachel and David, right? There's, there's other valences of those two comparisons, right? The Rachel, Shaul, Esther comparison is, um, it's sort of a lineage, right? And it's also, um, 
it's also a lineage of sort of questionable leadership, right? Not questionable, but not complete, right? None of those, the whole point of all of those people is they're not King David, right? Rachel ends up as sort of like the second wife and her descendant is not, her descendant is the, the king who ends up being replaced and Yosef is not really the Behor and whatever. And Shaul is the king who's replaced and Esther is a, she's a real queen, but not of the Jews, right? So she's also in a somewhat precarious position the whole time. So like, whereas David is like the real deal. Um, and I think that that question of sort of, what is this posture that these texts seem to be asking for, this posture of sort of putting other people before you and withholding of yourself for someone else's sake, assuming that that's sort of a good way to read these, what does that, what does that do for your chances of being a leader? Um, you just, Yuna is the, the, well, actually that's gonna come up in the next thing, so I'm not gonna talk about it. Yuna's not before either, but Yehuda ends up being the, everyone else has been disqualified by that point, right? Like. We'll talk about it in a second. Um. And when you act selflessly as a leader, people end up looking up to you. People end up um, wanting to 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 uh, to let you lead because they see that you have their best interests at heart. Right. So I, that's a one hopes that that is true. It does not always seem to be the case yeah. in our observations, right? Um, that people you know respond in kind when you treat them respectfully, but. Um, Right. In some ways, that this little piece at the end of the Gemara and Megillah is kind of like that, right? God sort of gives out greatness to people. And the only way you can screw it up is by getting too assured of your own greatness, right? Like you can keep it if you maintain a certain sense of humility about it. Um, so that, that, that does seem to be kind of there. But I think that there's a little bit of a, there may be a little bit of a tension, which maybe we'll see in this Gemara. Um, so here's the Gemara from Baba Batra, which is going to have the same whole thing with Rachel, but it comes up in a slightly different context. So we'll read fast when we get to the part that we've now read two times. Okay. So Bani Rabbi Chalbo and Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani. Rabbi Chalbo asked Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani, "Mara Yaakov shenatal bechorah miruvein unatanali Yosef." Why did Yaakov? What Mara Yaakov? Like, so what was what was Yaakov thinking basically when he took the status of firstborn from Reuven and gave it to Yosef? Presumably when he, you know, started. Um, well, I don't know when this is referring to, right? It could be referring to later at the end of their life when Yaakov gives Yosef Shechem Echad, right? He gives him an extra portion, which is like what the Bechor is supposed to get. It could be referring to the beginning when he gives him the special coat, right? But it seems like throughout the story, it, it seems like, right, Yaakov treats Yosef as the most important child in the way that a Bechor is often treated. Okay, so how, what, what was sort of basically, what was he thinking when he did that, right? Um, Mara Yaakov, right? Mara, ah, right? So then he says, what do you mean, what, what was he thinking, right? Right, like it says, right? Like he defiles his father's couch, meaning like, oh, sorry, this is a pasuk from, first of all, Yaakov actually says this to um, Reuven in the, in Vayichi, he says, as chilata yitzui ala, you sort of defiled my couch because there's this incident with Reuven and um his father, he sleeps with his father's concubine, which is interpreted differently by Rashi, but okay, right? So like, there's some incident where Reuven kind of oversteps his boundaries, right? He, he moves from trying, from being the oldest son to kind of, kind of trying to supplant his father prematurely, right? And because of that, he's kind of like uh, shunted to the side. Um, so what do you mean? Like, why would he take it from Reuven and give it to Yosef? Reuven has disqualified himself through this activity. And in fact, it says as much, right? Because Reuven did this bad thing in Birayamim, right? His birthright was given to Yosef, okay. Ella, rather, here's what he really asked. Mara Ashen Yosef. I understand why Reuven lost it, but why did Yosef get it? So this goes back to my mother's point from before, right? It, in the sort of shot, right? It's basically like Reuven disqualifies himself. Shimon and Levi disqualify themselves when they kill all of Stom, and then Yehuda's the next one, right? And Yehuda almost disqualifies himself, but then he saves himself in Maset Tamar and whatever. Okay, great story. Parsha, par, coming soon to a Parsha share near you, um, maybe. But, right, so like, the question is not, why did he take it from Reuven? Everyone knows why, but why would he give it to Yosef? Why not Yehuda? Why not Zavulun, right? Like there's a lot of sons here. Um, so I'm Shalach HaMashal, what's it like? Here's an analogy, right? Lama Devar Dumel, Labal HaBayit Shegadal Yatom Betoch Beto, right? Uh, somebody who's raising an orphan, which is interesting, right? Cause like he's not raising an orphan, he's raising his own son, but okay. Liamim HaEshiro To Yatom, right? That orphan gets rich eventually. Vamar Ahanehu Labal HaBayit, right? Minichasi. In the Hasai, probably, right? He says, like, you know, now that I finally made it, I'm going to go and pay back that guy who took me in all those many years ago. 
which is like, I mean, it, it could be not an orphan. There's, you can think of a lot of situations like this, where like somebody sort of does you a favor that they don't expect something back from you, but if you make it big, you want to give back to them. That's like sort of, it's saying it's a natural thing. And how, what's the analogy, right? Amarle, sorry. Right, so how is who? How is it like that's when the, the Koran explains it like this. Like, this is, as far as I'm concerned, fine explanation, right? Similarly, since Yosef benefited Yaakov, right? Yaakov is basically like the orphan who goes down to Egypt with no food and Yosef takes care of him, even though he's not a, he doesn't have a paternal obligation to him necessarily, right? Maybe he takes more care of him than is required by Kibbut Avayim even. Um, so Yaakov feels like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll give him some extra when I die and I have money to give out, right? Um, which is okay, right? So it's no, I think what this Gemara is trying to avoid is the idea that like he liked Yosef better because that's not a good explanation, right? Like we don't, even though that seems to be what's going on in the text, right? We can see that that has a lot of problems. We want Yosef to sort of like have a better motive than that, right? So it's not that he liked him better. He felt like he owed him. So he's sort of paying him back, right? So, but they said to him, I'm really, we love to chataru vein, lo Yosef, right? Right, like, okay, that's very nice. But like, if Ruvain, would he have, would that have been enough to take it away from Ruvain or not? Right. Would it have been like you're saying, well, Ruben lost it. And once it's sort of like free floating in the air, it's going to go to Yosef because Yosef was kind to or sort of like benefited um, Yaakov. But like that's it feels kind of like piecemeal and a little bit like backwards constructed because right, like if Ruben hadn't done this, are you saying that like the fact that Yaakov could have taken it away from Ruben because Yosef was so nice to him? And if not, then like you still haven't really answered the question of why Yosef. Right. Um, Ella. Rabbi Yonatan, Rav Chalok HaChamar. So this is a back and forth between this. is rather your teacher, Rabbi Yonatan, right? So um, Rabbi Chalbo is the one who asks. Rabbi Chalbo Rachmani tries to give an answer. Rabbi Chalbo is like, that's not a good answer. So Rabbi Chalbo, it seems like, was being a little didactic here, right? Because he asked him a question. He knew he was going to give an answer that wasn't good. And then he gives him a better answer. Uh, he's like quizzing him, right? And he's like, actually, your teacher, it's like a little little rebuke, right? Um, your teacher says, Right, it should have been that the firstborn status came from Rachel, as it is written, Ela Taldot Yaakov Yosef. Right, um, this is one of those places. There are several places in Breshit where it says Ela Taldot Blah. These are the generations of Blah. Usually, then you have a list of begats, right? So and so begat so and so when they were 100 years old, or whatever. But sometimes it doesn't have that. It just has a story, right? Yitzchak was this many years old and he got married or not or whatever, right? Yosef, this happened to him and then he went to Egypt, right? Like, um, so when there's a story, it's kind of remarkable. So they're saying, actually, the reason it's phrased that way is to hint to you that it should have been, if you were going to list the descendants of Yaakov, that Yosef would be first, right? Um, Ela shikimata Leah barachamim, right? But Leah kind of supplanted her, came before her with mercy, Whose mercy will ask in a second? Right? So it's interesting how to parse this, right? And because of the tsniyut that Rachel had, then God returned it to, um, to Rachel. Um, so first of all, who's Rachamim? So everything that's not in bold on this side of the page is interpretation. So who is Rachamim are the ones that cause Leah to have the first child? I don't know it's Rachel. It's Rachel's right. Rachel the... took pity on her. Um, maybe, right? Leah gets married first. So this is maybe a we, all, we might think, like, many of us, I think, in our head have this vision of, like, well, Leah gets married first, so she gets a head start in having babies, but actually they get married a week apart. So, like, Leah doesn't have to have babies first just because of the sequence of, um, as far as I, as I recall, there may be, like, a slightly ambiguous term, but basically, like, he works for seven years, he thinks it's for Rachel, it's not for Rachel, and then he says, oh, work for me for another seven years, but he marries Rachel, and then he has to work for the seven years, and then he has to work for the year, seven years for the animals and whatever. Um, so, it's not because they get married. It's not because of Rachel taking pity on her that they, she sort of gets married, that she has babies first, because they could have basically, you know, like one week doesn't give you a big advantage in that direction. But it seems like it's probably God's mercy, right? Like Leah's position was so pathetic because even though her sister like saved her from shame, she ends up as the hated wife, right? And it says God saw that Rachel, that Leah is hated. So he opens her womb so that she can at least have babies. Um, 
I don't know what that did to the psychological state of those babies, but okay, right? Like, can you can you, for the parse the, can you parse out yeah. the word shakadmata? That's feminine past tense. Leia advanced. Leia took right. Leia advanced over her Rachel through Rachamim, meaning through God's mercy, God having sort of pity Leia or mercy. Rachamim. Oh, okay. Yeah, but. But Barachamim in the sentence there sounds parallel to Mitoch Tzniyut. And surely yeah. we're not saying that Hashem had Tzniyut too. No, because it's Tzniyut Shehetah Baba Rachel, right? Basically, it should have been that Rachel has the first child. First of all, because she was supposed to be the first wife. She ends up sort of like kneecapping her own capacity to be the first slash only wife, right? And then right. Leah is in this terrible position where she avoided one moment of public shame for like a lifetime of being the hated wife, Right. And now, right, God feels bad for her and gives her children first, but because Rachel's sneut, right, is seems like is the thing that led to this whole situation, he's not going to punish Rachel for it. So he's sort of like, you know, in the end, she gets it back through Yosef being in some sense the behold. Um, yeah, just the Barachamim having Hashem as its antecedent seems like a little schwer. Yeah. Okay. So there's actually gonna. Um, well, the Gemara purports to explain that here. I'm not sure it does, but let's let's see. Right. My What does it mean that Rachel Leah came before Rachel with mercy? Right. Leah had these weak eyes. What does it mean weak eyes? If you say it really means weak eyes, right? Um, then they have this sort of this thing, even when a, there's a verse that doesn't, you won't even insult a tame animal. It doesn't say a behemach mea, it says behema asher lo tehora. So you're telling me that it's going to start, if we don't want to use the word, the negative adjective tame about an animal, you're telling me that we're going to use the negative adjective weak about like one of the study code of our, of our Torah. So it must be something else. It must mean, um, right? Her, um, her gifts, meaning her, what was given to her descendants, this is probably following Rashi, I would guess, right, were long-lasting Arukot. But somebody else, Rabamar, no, it's actually, her eyes were weak, but this is a story many of us heard in, like, elementary school, or people like to tell it, for those who went to, you know, day school, right, that she was, she used to cry all the time because she thought she's going to have to marry Asa because she's the older of two daughters, and her aunt has two sons, and they're going to get matched off, and she knows that Asa is a bad guy, and she's, you know, she's sort of She's listening in on, on the rumors about them, and she's, she's sort of despondent that she's going to end up married to this bad guy, and then her eyes end up ugly. Um, her, it's, it's interesting. The speci I feel like they didn't tell us this in fourth grade, but right, her eyelashes fell out. Okay. Um, so God saw that Leah was hated, meaning by Lavan. My snua, right? What do you mean by snua? It can't be that she's hated because, again, the same thing. We don't use negative adjectives about people, right? Um, Right? It's not that Leah was hated, it's that Leah was a hater, but a hater of bad stuff. This is the first sort of like reading that turns it on its head. So God, um, sort of to reward her for her, um, in some ways, she's like Rachel, where like doing the right thing is what puts her in the bad position, right? Doing the right thing of not wanting to marry Asaf is what makes her undesirable as a spouse and then makes her like, you know, her father need to trick somebody into marrying her, basically. Um, so Right, like God sort of has pity on her and and Rahma because of Rahamim, right? Um, I think that seems to be um, what's going on, right? So that's sort of um okay, right? Like, and they don't even have a second literal meaning of Snua. It's not that she's hated by by um it's not that he's sort of, it's sort of pity because she's hated by Yaakov, but it's similar to the way it's going to be for Rachel, it's a reward for Leah, right? It's sort of like, Rachel was supposed to have kids first. Then Leah was sort of proved herself to be so pious by not wanting to marry Asaph, so she had kids first. But then Rachel also proved herself to be so pious, and so she sort of like gets kids that come out first, second first, right? Um, what was the tzniyut that Rachel displayed, right? Who read this whole story? She said, um, he said, will you marry me? She said, my father's going to cheat you. He said, yes, I am. I'm his brother. And they get, she, they sort of transferred Simanim. Um, and, right. Um, but then she thought, oh, my sister's going to be humiliated. So she gave her the signs and it turned out as land. She didn't know. So this is its new that caused Leah, that caused Rachel to sort of get the Bechorah back. Um, okay. 
So I guess like what I wanted to conclude with there is some some sort of, I know I overshot. I overshot by like two minutes. So you can feel free to go, but I will be done too. Um, right, there's something kind of interesting about, right, the idea that it's almost like in order to become the leader, you're like competing about how self-negating you can be, right? Like being more self-negating makes you more of the leader, right? And then we even end up wanting to try, sort of project that onto David, who is not a very self-negating person, right? Like in the shot, that's not like a thing that we would necessarily, it's a thing that we say about Shaul a lot, but with David, it doesn't seem quite, maybe at the very beginning of his life, but like, that's not really, that's not really him, right? Unless it's very strategic. Sometimes he's very strategic, but he's not like just sort of a self-negating person. Um, and I think, right, there's something, so I'll say two things. First of all, like there's there's a, a com there seems to be a comment about leadership and sort of being in a, in a the top position requires you to actually not want it so much, right? Or be willing to give it up. Um, that's one thing. But the second thing, that's actually maybe an Akeda point also, but right, the second thing is in terms of, if we want to sort of project back and think about the relationship between Rachel and, like, and Yaakov, right? Like fundamentally we're praising Rachel for doing something that sacrificed her communication with her husband for the sake of the shame of her sister, right? And one of the things we've maybe seen in some of the stories we learned at the very beginning also is how, right, sometimes the, the marriage partners need to kind of control their own ego in order to have a a good relationship here she's doing that because it's the right thing to do but it actually poisons her relationship in some way not helps it um but it's still kind of looked up to as she did the right thing right she, she saved her sister from shame maybe next week we'll learn more about saving people from shame and how terrible shame is considered right and there's actually a big marital component in that so yeah um i don't want to promise that i think that's what we'll do next week and um Am I not supposed to give away the goat that I haven't totally decided? Whatever, <laughs> I think that's all I'll do. But um, right, so there's there's something sort of interesting about how right this the consideration of dignity actually here is or is sort of antagonistic to the marriage, right? Because it's the sister's dignity, not the the spouse's. Um, right, the primary relationship is between Rachel and Leah, right? And interestingly, if we go back and think about right David and Shaul, or David and Yonatan maybe is like in the background there, but there's something kind of like right, people's, um, right, the, even though it starts with this scene of like, you know, collusion and intimacy between Rachel and Yaakov, right, it takes a surprise twist where like actually she, she sacrifices that or kills that for the sake of her sister, right, which is sort of, but it seems like that's not being judged negatively. So that's kind of like interesting. Right, and maybe the reason it's not being judged negatively is because Yaakov is sort of judged negatively for trying to trick someone in the first place, right, for coming up with this scheme. I don't know, that's my, that's just a guess. But I think, um, yeah, like there's, the marriage here is almost sort of incidental or like part of what she's being praised for is being willing to give up, right? Whereas before it sort of felt like in some of our other stories, but like if only the spouses would give up sort of their ego, they could save their marriage. Here it's like, she's being willing to give up her marriage to save something else her marriage and her ego in some way to say something else, right? That's sort of like an interesting countervalence, maybe. I'm gonna stop share so I can see those who are here. But um, so uh, it was four minutes extra. Thank you all for coming. I'm happy to like stay and hear people's thoughts, but I don't want you to feel like you have to stay. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Which, um, are there any Gemaras uh, or Midrashim that talk about after the fact that, that um, like the next day or the next week, like Yaakov and, and Rachel's relationship, how it overcame that that lack of trust or the break. Right. Of trust. So that's what I was kind of like. That's what I was hoping to find. It could be that there are, but I have not yet uncovered them. That's what I will say. Meaning, like, also, like it could be they're not Gemaras. It could be that they're certainly shame. I don't know. That is that's still an uh, open question for me. But I think that that's sort of right. You would like to see something that's kind of like, yeah, like. Then what? Meaning, does Yaakov hold, it seems like Yaakov doesn't hold this against her, right? Certainly not the way it's, right? Yaakov still loves her forever. He loves her more than Leah, right? And the person who tricked him is Lavan. He sort of projects it all onto Lavan. Um, and like, why does he know that Rachel gave up the, the Shimanim voluntarily? Like, who knows, right? Um, and those are all like really interesting questions, yeah. The focus really is on both the tension between Rachel and Leah in their competition and Lavan and Yaakov, 
that becomes much more of a focus than either of the love relationships. Right. Well, right. Yeah, because like the whole in the injecting of Leia into the Yaakov Rachel relationship removes it from being a love relationship, right? In some ways, it becomes more of sort of like a transactional family relationship. Um, or not necessarily only transactional, but it's sort of like like Leia basically, sorry, Rachel basically like gives up that possibility essentially forever, right? Of having like, you know, this the kind of intimate relationship that she has with Lava, with Yaakov there. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, all. This was a thank great class. I really and appreciate it. As always. So thank you, Hiddis, for organizing. Oh, no problem. And just uh, some uh, a quick, I guess, housekeeping. Um, thank you for joining us tonight on Zoom. And I do hope that you will, will take advantage of our other fall classes that are going on. We're going to be continuing throughout uh, tomorrow, I guess, 1 p.m. with a uh, class on philosophy. Dr. Durer Bondi is going to be talking about that. Uh, Sorry, he's going to be talking about Abraham Joshua Heschel, and he'll be talking about the prophets and human dignity as a divine concern. So I do expect it to be another intriguing conversation on a little bit of a different twist of human dignity and relationships. And I do hope that you will uh, will join us. The registration information for that class and the rest of the classes that are going to be starting to take place again next week are all on our website. Please visit www.drisha.org forward slash classes and the Zoom and the Facebook Live and the Drisha Live links are all there. Um, I do hope that uh, everybody has a wonderful rest of your night and hopefully I'll see you guys again, same time, same place next week and maybe even sooner in our other classes. Have a wonderful night. Bye-bye. All righty. Thank you.